Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida Facebook page. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I'm here with a very special guest. I am here with a person I've been trying to get a hold of since pretty much the beginning of Old School Lane. He is the creator of the Angry Beavers. We have Mitch Shower. Mitch, welcome to Casual Chats. Hey, thanks for having me. That's it's great, Patricia. Absolutely. So, um, I would like to know uh, personally. So, what were your influences in writing and animation and all that stuff? Well, I you know I grew up with all the classic. Warner Brothers cartoons and Tex Avery and that kind of thing. So that that it really inspired me. But uh, I'm also a film fan, live action film fan. I, I tend to lean toward classic horror films. So uh, anyway, I was always kind of ingesting that, and then with the animation. So when I got to the age where I could actually maybe uh, make money at doing this, I was torn between being a comic book artist because I collected Marvel comics for years, or being in an animation. And I guess animation won, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh who are your favorites in the marvel uh lineup well like you know i i was a big fan of uh, when i came into marvel jack kirby was still in the fantastic four so i followed them and uh you know i, I just kind of bought all the marvel stuff for a while and uh, uh fantastic four spider-man yeah, anything that i liked the drawings i you know i was really into the artwork so uh Jumbo Seema and all those guys. So I would follow any of those comic book artists that I thought were really good, like Neil Adams, those guys. But uh, Marvel, then I, I collected Marvel comics for years and years, and I still have them in boxes uh, in sleeves out here at the garage because I, I figured my kids and grandkids could maybe sell them for $25 someday. <laughs> Well, considering that Marvel has become such a big thing nowadays, um, I wouldn't be too surprised if maybe it'll be a little bit higher than that. Well, you never know. And you know what? The last 10 years, i have uh, it was just by happenstance, I've worked for Marvel for the last 10 years. Uh, so all that comic book buying and uh, wanting to be a comic book artist came in handy. Oh, absolutely. And, and speaking of horror, which is definitely going to be apparent when we reach uh, the discussion of Angry Beavers, what were your personal favorites? You mean his characters or movies? Both, actually, yeah. Go, go both. Yeah. Well, the, the classic Universal monsters I always liked because that's what I grew up on. Uh, and then I would study about those and how those films were made. Um, I'm not into slasher films, really. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed Halloween, the original Halloween. But uh, the, the horror movies I watch today is I, I really enjoyed Mama. I, I really liked that film. Uh, and the one, uh, uh, Crimson Peak, I like that. And Drag Me to Hell. So things like that that have a little bit of a fantasy element, I'm okay with. But things like Saw or any of those kinds of things, I just like, wow, you could really do that. So that's not that's not scary. That's terrifying. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a huge difference, absolutely. Yes. I, I mean, I don't know if this has been 100% confirmed, uh, it, you know, given the, the Internet. I mean, it's it can be a, a crapshoot. But, you know, it's said about, like, how, you know, when you were, like, a teenager – you know, you kind of like was wandering around because um, your parents died at a very young age and you had pretty much nowhere to go. And then you were, you know, being, you know, you were traveling with hobos or something like that. Well, somebody else wrote that and I don't know who wrote it, but I thought it was so funny. I kept it. <laughs> I thought I actually told somebody that this is more interesting than what really happened. So I haven't changed it yet. But no, that's not true. But it's really funny. It's hilarious, actually. I mean, if if that were to be true, that would be that would make like for a really interesting based off of a true story movie. That's for sure. A kid whose parents died at a young age, and then he had nowhere to go, so he pretty much just went from place to place, and eventually went with hobos. So, yes. 
So, I mean, if if you don't mind, I mean, if it's too personal, I completely understand. So, what really did happen? What really did happen? Well, I was born to normal parents. Uh, <laughs> they lived uh, to be very old. Um, I was really just kind of a middle class kid with uh, with blue collar working parents. They both worked and uh, you know rode my bicycles and ran around with the guys, and it was just a normal childhood. Then my folks eventually did divorce. So that kind of changed my life, and I went on to another direction with uh, all kinds of things. We can go into another interview. And then um, I went to college. I went to CalArts. went to Art Center, got my degree from Art Center. And while I was at Art Center, I started in the animation business because they were looking for artists. Right. And so um, for, her, for, the, for the person who posted that on Wikipedia, um, that, please change that. <laughs> no, I'll change it, but uh, it's, just, it's just so funny. And people are like, oh, you got to change that. That's not true. And I'm like, yeah, but it's really funny. Yeah, I, I know. It is hilarious. <laughs> I wish it was true. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should make a comic on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so speaking into the animation business, so you started off um, with, you know, working on, like, various shows, like one of them being uh, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. And yeah. um, a few of my friends uh, from... Um, Online, also they do a. They've been doing a Scooby Doo retrospective for years, and they've been talking about that. And yeah, um, so yeah, what was your experience with that? Well, I uh, was hired. To, I went to work at Filmation, and then after Filmation, I went over to Hanna Barbera, and I was a, a storyboard artist at Hanna Barbera. And then uh, I got offered a job to work on Pink Panther and Sons, and got to work with Frizz Freeling, which was a thrill. Wow. He didn't really like me uh, being the kid on the staff. But once I left Pink Panther and Sons, he and I became best friends. And he would call me and we would talk about stuff. He was just a great guy. Uh, and then from that, from that show, then uh, Jean McCurdy, who was heading a production at, uh, not production, she was headed up creative or something at Hanna-Barbera. I made friends with her and she goes, how would you like to produce Scooby-Doo? And I'm like, yeah. Because back in that day, you know, if you were a storyboard artist or a layout artist or a writer or whatever, you just, that's all you did. You couldn't move around. You couldn't change positions or change jobs. So uh, I was very fortunate that she offered me the, the gig to produce 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. So I did a season of that. We just did 13 of them. <laughs> so that's how I got started as a producer. And it just went from there. Okay, so how was the transition from working at, like, Filmation to Hanna-Barbera, then eventually working over to Nickelodeon? Well, you know, this uh, the animation business, TV animation, it's very nomadic. And um, back in the day when animation had a, you know, had a big slot on a Saturday morning and then uh, weekday afternoons with the syndication, you just kind of moved around from job to job and people knew who you were. So if you finished up Scooby-Doo, somebody would call like, I hear you finish up Scooby-Doo. You want to come over here and work on Bonanza or work on the Cowboys, uh, uh, Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa or something like that. So you just kind of move around. And then uh, while I was working with Gunther Wall, I was working there with them doing the Cowboys of Moo Mesa. Lee Gunther, one of the bosses of the company, came to me and goes, there's an opening at Nickelodeon to pitch some shows. So why don't you come up with some stuff? So I came up with three shows, one of which was Angry Beavers. And uh, Mary Harrington, who was at uh, Nickelodeon at the time, and Jerry Laybourne was still there. She was just about to leave, but she was still there. Uh, I pitched that. And uh, that's the one Mary Harrington says, I really like, I really like this. And uh, so I went in and uh, they took the show. We did a pilot. And then the pilot went on the shelf because they were doing uh, uh, Hey Arnold. Right. They shelved Beaver's pilot and did Hey Arnold. And then I went to Warner Brothers in the meantime and was producing uh, Freakazoid. And then uh, I got a call from from Nickelodeon says well, we want to do the Angry Beaver show could you come do you want to come over here and do that so I did what were the other two shows that you pitched one was about a living house everything in the house was alive wow that's like almost a decade before Monster House <clears throat> yes and just as a sidebar uh, ABC one time the Saturday morning they wanted to put out movies they wanted to produce these Saturday morning movies so they called me up and said uh, Linda Steiner called me and goes Mitch if you're going to do a movie for a Saturday morning animated, what would you do? And I said, uh, I'd really like to do The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And uh, I think like 10 years after that, Disney made it. But uh, <laughs> I was always ahead of my time and uh, didn't even know it. Uh, That's awesome. 
So yeah, I, I have a lot of questions about the Angry Beaver. So I guess first off, um, what was the process when it was first starting? Like with you know getting the people who were involved with it, and um, you know eventually the voice cast and all that stuff. Well, the voice casting, uh, Richard Horvitz, who does Daggett, uh, it was his first recording job, I believe. And I think that's what he's told me. It was for his first job. And it, in, uh, we picked him for Daggett just like off the bat. He's just like, okay, that's Daggett. And then we did 300 auditions for Norbert, and we just couldn't get that chemistry until uh, Nick Bakai came along. And he and Richard had this terrific chemistry where they actually sounded like brothers and talked like brothers and they teased each other in real life so they teased each other on the show so once we had Richard and Nick uh, we were we were often running with recording um, and then uh, well we we were at Gunther Wall for a year and that's where we kind of started the writing Mary Harrington was the one initially who suggested that the boys be beavers I just had them as best friends because if we make them brothers I'm sorry brothers then they have to live together. So it was that was a brilliant idea. I said, okay, we'll do that. And uh, and then we started writing. Then after a year, Gunther Wall, Nickelodeon took the show and they they pulled it from Gunther Wall and took it in house. And then that's how I got to Nickelodeon full time. And uh, we started staffing up with people. And uh, they uh, they were all very young, younger than me. And uh, but they were game. You know, they really wanted to be a part of it. And they did great. They they were so talented, and they got even more talented because we supported them. And uh, you know, I don't run a show like you browbeat somebody or tell them that they're bad. You you support people, and you tell them, "Hey, that's really good. Now try this, try this, try this." And they did. So uh, you know, a lot of credit goes to those talented artists and writers and all the production people that worked on the show. How much of it was improv as opposed to being scripted? A lot of it was improv. Um, Richard and Nick were really great at improv, and I had the script. I directed the recording, so I would sit there with the script, and they'd start with the script, and then all of a sudden they drift off into something that was just hysterical. And I told him, I said, "I don't. I, I want you to do that. I don't care how you do it, just as long as you get back to the script at some point." So these guys would ad lib, and if they made a mistake, uh, I said, "Just keep going. You know, if you make a mistake, just talk to each other like you make a mistake. You made a mistake, and uh, they did." And then when we had guest stars come in, we would tell the guest stars, like, now these guys are going to ad lib and go off on tangents and just just jump in there. Don't don't be afraid. Just say what you got to say and keep going. And a lot of these actors who came in, they really enjoyed that because it just gave them so much freedom. And everybody just had a great time in the recording booth. And uh, that was that's what I wanted, because if it's fun in the booth, then it's fun on screen. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes. If you remember that uh, the Beaver episode up all night, which is like the second or third episode, uh, they have that laughing jag where they've been up too long and they start laughing. And uh, those guys are really laughing. Those uh, <laughs> Richard and Nick were really laughing. They just couldn't stop laughing. I, I said, let's just use it all. <laughs> Don't stop. So they were great. Yeah. You can definitely tell when watching the episodes that a lot of it is just off the wall improvisation because there's interruptions, there's talking over sentences. Uh, so you can definitely feel that it's kind of natural as opposed to being just, you know, one handedly being read from a script. Yes. And also, you know, another thing that's really a major standout for the Angry Beavers is the way that they emphasize punctuations and the way that they are able to not pronounce certain things and they say terms like thingy or whatever. So was that also part of the improvisation in which, you know, they just went with it or was that always part of the script? Well, things like uh, the, the thingy, uh, that that was in the script. Uh but as far as uh, the pronunciation of the words, Nick started that as Norbert, and it worked so well. I said, just just keep doing that when you feel like you want to do that, and he did. And then all of a sudden, I got called into Nickelodeon by management, and they said, you're going to have to go back and record those lines because he's mispronouncing the words. The big boss from New York came down, and he came to recording and says, how's it going? I said, well, they want to change this dialogue, and it's really funny. So he goes, let me hear some of it. So uh, we played him just like a minute of it where Nick was mispronouncing words. And uh, he stood up from the recording and goes, I'll see you in the fall. <laughs> so everything was fine. It was, we were good. 
uh, also, you know, another thing. Where did the word spoot come from? Yeah, I, as I recall, it came out of a writer's meeting because we were trying to come up with a word that replaced uh, 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 an expletive. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, somehow spoot came up, and uh, so it, that's our cuss word that we use. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, programs that have their own unique ways of cussing. So, yeah, why not? Yeah. So, um, and, okay, so I'm sure for, you know, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what are your personal favorite episodes of the series? Well, my very favorite is the Halloween special, The Day the World Got Really Screwed Up, because that combined the beavers with my, my love of uh, old horror films, old science fiction movies. Uh, so we really enjoyed that. Up All Night is good. Uh, there's bits and pieces in those things that uh, I really like. Uh, I love Barry Bear singing like a uh, Barry White, because um, the the composer we had on the show was just terrific, Charlie Brissett, and uh, he and I would sit down and, and spot the music for the shows. But uh, as far as liking the shows, uh, the Halloween special is probably my favorite. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, considering that it's the only one in the entire series that's 24 minutes long, and everything is just either homaging, breaking the fourth wall, or being a reference to like an old 1950s B-horror movie. I, yeah. I actually showed this to a few of my friends who had never seen the episode, and they said it was the most funniest thing that they had ever seen, and um, they just really, really enjoyed it. And this is from, the, and these guys, they've only watched like a handful of episodes of The Angry Beavers. They also do a podcast as well in which they take a look at like three Nicktoon episodes that are based on a theme, and this was their yeah. Halloween episode. And because yeah. I knew about the episode, I said, have you ever seen The Angry Beavers episode, The Day the World Got Really Screwed Up? And they said, no. And I'm like, you have to check it out. And they did, and they loved it. <laughs> Good. It was popular with Nickelodeon in New York. They really liked it, and they aired it a bunch of times when we when it after it first aired. It did, they played it all the time, and they I don't know if they still play it on Halloween or not. Mm, I think maybe they played it last year, but I'm not sure. Yeah, and then we did another one uh, that was an homage to like uh, bad B movies, but uh, we recorded another half hour special that was an homage to uh, the British company Hammer Films. Mm -hmm. We did it, and it was based on Dracula. Uh, and we had Terrence Stamp play Dracula. He, he was hilarious. Uh, and we had uh, Sheena Easton playing the Gypsy, and Michael York was playing Van Helsing. And I really wanted to make that show because it's uh, it was just hilarious involving Dago with vampires and all that. And uh, then they talked about making it into a movie, and then that didn't happen, so the show was never made. Oh, but it was, was this like a was this like a new show or was it a spinoff? No, it was no, it was a, a new Beaver. It was going to be another Beaver Halloween special. Oh, okay. This this I've never heard of before because whenever people talk about like you know unaired or canceled be you know Angry Beavers episodes, they always talk about the series finale Bye Bye Beaver. So I yeah. want to know more about that one. So please, uh, is, is there any more? Well, the the uh, we did uh, we did one more. Uh, it was going to be a rock opera. Oh, that would have been so good. And we actually had interest from uh, Jeff Lynn, who uh, is head of uh, Electric Light Orchestra, to, to actually compose the music. And we had interest from the band Chicago. Uh, they actually came in and talked to me, and they said, we'd really like to do this. And then I told Nick Lodi, hey, we can have Chicago do this rock opera. And uh, their answer was, well, kids don't know who Chicago is. Who cares? This would have that, that would have been awesome. I mean, there's so many references to Angry Beavers. Like, there's Beatles references. There's The Who. There's horror movies. There's Highlander. There's River yeah. Dancing. There's The <laughs> Love Boat. I mean, come on. Why not Chicago? Yeah. And it, it, was, uh, it was fun. We got it written. And we got scratch tracks done for the songs. And we had Jethro Tull. Uh, we, we did ripoffs of, like, Jethro Tull. And uh, I can't remember the other. Guess Who, maybe. So about like four or five bands and then we were going to take those songs and do kind of a, a yellow submarine sequence with it that's kind of surreal and then weave the beaver's story in through all of it and I, I was really looking forward to doing the rock opera oh that would have been so amazing oh uh, it's just too bad it didn't happen but man yeah. that sounds if, if i can if, if i can have an opportunity to see both of them you know i would pay to see that in a heartbeat well, great. I'm glad. I'm glad. Absolutely. It's nice to have fans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
anyway, a few other episodes that I, I want to talk to you about. So um, you, you actually had your daughters appear in a few episodes. So what was that experience like? Well, it was a lot of fun. Of course, they were much younger now, and now they're mothers. Oh, wow. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, at that time, uh, Stacy, the oldest one, she was really insecure about it. She did it, but she just felt like I'm not as good as my sister because Chelsea was re really into it, the younger one. She was into it, and, and uh, so I worked with them. You know, I and sometimes I would feed them lines and just get them comfortable. But they did fine on their own, and uh, so we did A Few and Sisters, uh, and I think they're in uh, one or two more. And then we did a actually at the end of the series we did a pilot uh, called Simply Sisters with them doing the voices. And we were going to do a spinoff show with the sisters, <clears throat> and then have the Beavers guest star once in a while. Oh, wow. uh, and, and we it turned out really well. It, it's a it's a well done pilot. Uh, the quality of it's really nice. And we had uh, uh, Shirley Walker do the music who was responsible for a lot of the uh, Warner's Batman music and she did a beautiful job and uh, I, I really had high hopes that that would spin off because uh, I, I thought well we've done guys let's do some girls now you know and I was going to hire female writers and uh, girl writers and girl producer and I just wanted to be a girl staff because girls know more about girls than we do that I do and uh, you know I was I just wanted to get into things that girls really talk about and not just have the stereotypical let's put on mom's makeup and let's dress in mom's clothes. I wanted to get deeper into it. Uh, what girls talk about and what they think. I just think that would have been a great show. Oh, that, that again, I've never heard of. And again, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, it was narrated by Alyssa Milano. Oh, wow. She was she was playing one of the Beaver sisters as an adult, talking about growing up together. And uh, it, it's really cute. That's awesome. I mean, I'll just let you know this, that... Um, you know, I do a series, uh, a podcast series for another YouTube channel called Nick's Missile, where I talk about like canceled or rejected pilot spinoff series and all that stuff. And I'll definitely mention that in the in an episode because that's really interesting. Good, good. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's all the questions I have about for the Angry Beavers. Um, uh, oh, oh, but one more. Um, do you still, you know, keep in touch with any of the people who have worked on the show? Yeah, I talked to Richard. Uh, we actually FaceTime with each other, even though he lives nearby. But I talked to Richard quite a bit, and uh, we've stayed fast friends for all these years. I haven't talked to Nick. He went off into live action with uh, the King of Queens and uh, Mall Cop and all that stuff. Um, and every once in a while, I run across the writers. Mike Lessa, who was the line producer on the show, he and I are, are still doing projects together, and uh, he was a great guy. And I have to give Mike a lot of credit on the show. He, he's one of the line producers. He's the finest line producer I've ever worked with because he could take a budget and a schedule on a show, and by the time you got to the end of it, you got everything you wanted, and it looked just the way you wanted it to look, and you never felt like you had to ask for more money or anything else. You used the money you had, and he was just, he was just amazing at giving you what you want but remaining on budget. So he's a, and he's a great guy. Uh, so we stay, I just saw him yesterday. So I, I keep in touch with them. And uh, the other people, they have a beaver party every year. I think usually in the fall. I haven't gone to one, but I, I promised them that I would go to the next one. So that may be in October. And everybody that worked on the show gets together and they have a dinner. So uh, I probably should go to one of those. Yeah, definitely. Because last month, it was the 20th anniversary of the Angry Beavers. Yeah, I know. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, I think you and I should put a couple of things to rest. Number one is the last episode. Okay. I mean, there's information flying around town about this thing and what happened and all that kind of thing. And actually, there was a, a, a woman who worked at Nickelodeon in management who's not there anymore who uh, accused me of actually killing the beavers in the last episode. Uh, and that's why they didn't air it. And that wasn't true. The whole idea of the last episode was as the cartoon went along, Norbert was trying to convince Daggett that they weren't real. They were cartoons. So as the cartoon goes along, it's in full color, and then all of a sudden it's in black and white, and then all of a sudden it's just line drawings, and then all of a sudden it looks like stick figures, and uh, then it's just script pages with them talking. Uh, and the whole idea was if they want to bring the beavers back, you just bring them back. They're not dead. Uh, and Dag was just having the hardest time understanding that he was a cartoon. That was the whole point of that episode. So there was no death of beavers. 
Nobody was going to kill the beavers. No, no, no. Well, don't, don't trust me. Don't you worry. I mean, there's a whole bunch of dumb, creepy pasta. Oh, the, the, this whole episode is about this person dying or committing suicide thing. Trust me. I, I, um, Craig Bartlett um, actually had to correct somebody who said, oh, the whole p episode about Pigeon Man, the original story was that he was going to commit suicide. It's like, and then Craig had to tell them, no, this, this is complete crap. That's not, that's not the whole intention. So trust me, this isn't the first and it will certainly not be the last. Well, Craig's right. I mean, not only would you not do that, but you wouldn't be allowed to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, then, and then the second thing I want to talk about is the show that everybody talks about where the beavers said swear words and it was bleeped. Oh. <laughs> I remember hearing about that, yeah. So they, when we did the recording of the show, Norbert said, shut up, Dag. He said, shut up. Then we tried, uh, the, the Nickelodeon says, we can't say shut up anymore. But I know that one of the characters on Hey Arnold, the girl, I can't remember her name. Helga. She, Helga would say shut up once in a while. So we thought, well, we're, we're good. We can say shut up. So all of a sudden the rule came down. We can't say shut up anymore. So then we tried hush up. And then we, uh, we tried all kinds of things because it has to fit the lip sync. So I said, why don't we just bleep it? So all of a sudden all these uh, people started writing like, this is what they said. And really, it was just to get around having to say something stupid. So I just put it, bleeped it, and it just took off on its own. Uh, okay. So, yeah, if, if anybody thought it was going to be, like, something, like, really out of the ordinary, like, I think that a few years ago, there was a, a Dexter's Lab episode called Dexter's Rude Removal, where there was, like, this whole rumor that it was just going to be all nothing but swear words, but it was just bleeped, and everybody was disappointed. So, eh, you know, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had an episode one time where the, with the Waylon Jennings. It was the way they meet kid friendly. Yes. And it was Western. Well, that that all came from uh, Nick Loden always sending their notes on the scripts. Uh, you know, this needs to be kid friendly. This should be kid friendly. Uh, so we just made a villain named Kid Friendly, and <laughs> and, and Waylon Jennings did the voice, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, it's basically the opposite. It's like instead of being mean, he's just like a sweet little guy, but he's just really annoying. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I think that should be it for my Angry Beavers question. So, um, so eventually, as time went on, you started working on other projects, especially with comic books. So, um, what would you say would would be like a difference between like you know when you started doing cartoons as opposed to like doing comic books on like a consistent basis? Well, I was uh, I was working at uh, I was working somewhere at animation, and then. Uh, I got an offer from Mark Evanier, would you like to do DNA Agents for Eclipse Comics? And I said, oh man, I'd love to do that. So uh, while I was producing, during the day I'd have to go home at night and draw comics. And as much as I love comics, it's really hard to fill up a white, big white sheet of paper with drawings after you've worked all day. So I was able to do it for just a little over a year. And I did DNA Agents and did some stuff for DC and did a Johnny Quest issue. And then uh, I just kind of like, you know, I got to focus on what I'm working on. So after that, then when I wound up at Marvel, I wound up on the working on the Lionsgate Marvel movies, uh, like the next Avengers. I did the character designs for that and uh, did some boarding for them and character designs on one of their other movies. And then uh, Craig Kyle came to me one day. He was he was in charge of the studio at that time. And he goes, um, I said, Craig, if you ever have a series or something you want to do, just keep me in mind because I'd really like to do it. And sure enough, like two weeks later, I got a call of Mitch. Would you like to do Superhero Squad? And I was like, yeah, sure. So uh, we did 52 of those. And then that led into Hulk and Agents of Smash. We did 52 of those. And then I just finished up two uh, Marvel movies for them for Netflix. Uh, one was uh, for three to five-year-old boys about Christmas. And then the other one was for older kids called Where Monsters Dwell. And that's on Netflix now. Okay, cool. Cool. So uh, I'll, def I'll definitely leave a link to that in the description box below. So yeah, I, am, I think that uh, one more thing to wrap things up. Um, so yeah, uh, with the Angry Beaver celebrating its 20th anniversary, I mean, how do you see like the legacy as a whole? Well, I think Beavers, uh, I've often wondered what would happen if we brought them back. Uh, and I, I did pitch a show to them about the Beavers years later. Daggett's still single, but Mor Norbert's married and has kids. Is he married to Tree Flower? Yeah, I was thinking about Tree Flower. Yeah. So they get back together, and uh, my daughter came up with the title, and it was Angry Beavers Respooted. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, I thought, well, this will work because now we can actually talk about 
adults dealing with kids, dealing with each other. So you, you just kind of expand on the original premise. Uh, and nothing really happened with them because I guess Nick, they kind of, they've been kind of on and off about like, well, we want to bring back the classic characters, do new shows, and then no, 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 yeah, we want to bring them back. So it's kind of like the sporadic thing. And I know they're doing a Hey Arnold uh, yes. TV movie, and I think they're doing uh, Zim. Yeah, they're maybe? doing um, they're doing Hey Arnold, then Rocco's Modern Life, and then Invader Zim. <clears throat> so hopefully Beavers will be one of them somewhere down the line. Oh, that'd be great, especially if you can pitch that one about where they're adults. Because, you know, with Fuller House and Girl Meets World, I think it wouldn't be too shocking to see something like that. Yes. And just as a tidbit on it, I, I kind of like to get to, to get to together. And uh, I wanted to base it around the movie Sh- The Shining. Um, so. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. But I could see Daggett chasing two kids with an axe, couldn't you? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> That'd be fun. So, All right, I think that should be it for this episode. So please, Mitch, um, tell us if any upcoming projects that you have or, you know, plug and promote your stuff or whatever. Okay, well, I'll, if anything happens, I'll get in touch with you because you are in the know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think that should be it for this episode of Casual Chess. Let us know in the comments below about, um, you know, your personal favorite episodes of the Angry Beavers and other projects that Mitch has been involved. So that's it. Hope to see you around soon, and thank you for listening. And thank you for having me.